Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, are you able to hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you for uh, having me here. Um, I am a researcher at Microsoft Research. Uh, before that, I've worked in the industry uh, for a number of years designing uh, processors and Ethernet controllers and the like. Uh, I was uh, involved in the industry very early on when IP cores became uh, popular. Uh, I used to work at LSI Logic, after which I worked at a couple of startups. Uh, then I went back to University of Wisconsin-Madison to get a PhD, and now I'm at Microsoft Research. Um, the semiconductor industry is struggling for innovation and revenue growth. And we believe that open source hardware can be a solution. But before that, it must overcome a few challenges. And today I will present what these challenges are and how we might overcome them. My presentation is based on a uh, paper that I co-authored with my uh, colleagues at uh, UW-Madison, Tony Nowatsky, uh, Vinay Gangadhar, and Karthi K. N. Sankaralingam. This paper will appear in IEEE Micro shortly, but it is also available on archive meanwhile. The blue plot in this graph shows the uh, industry's total revenue over last two decades. From 96 to 2011, the revenue grew by about 6.3% year to year. Despite two, despite two market crashes in 2002 and uh, 2008. But since 2011, the revenue growth has been pretty much flat, flat lined. The next, this table here compares the revenue for Q1 of 2016 and 2015 of the top 20 companies. And collectively, these companies have lost revenue to the tune of 6% year to year in Q1. And this data is very similar to what they have done in a few preceding quarters. So in a sense, the semiconductor industry is really hurting for growth. There were two trends which were key to the revenue growth from 96 to 2011. With each successive generation, products introduced new features and had higher performance, all the while reduced while their prices dropped. So they were getting cheaper, and yet they were providing more features and higher performance to the users. But over the last few years, these trends have stalled, which have also stalled the industry's revenue growth. This graph here shows the characteristics of Intel products ever since Intel started shipping products from 1970 until the present day. The y-axis is plotted on the logarithmic scale. The topmost blue plot shows the transistors per chip. The next aquamarine plot shows the maximum clock speed of each Intel processor. And the bottommost green plot shows the uh, maximum thermal rating of the device, which is basically the thermal power cap. Until about 2008, the transistors per chip grew, almost doubling, uh, doubling almost every two years. The clock frequency scaled, as did the thermal, cap the thermal cap of the devices. What this meant was more and more transistors were becoming available. They could be operated simultaneously, introducing newer features for the users. And the performance scaling indicated that the device performance was scaling. And this was contributing to the revenue growths. But after 2008, the transistors per chip continued scaling, thanks to Moore's law. 
but the thermal capacity stopped scaling. What this meant was that you now had more transistors, but you could not operate them simultaneously. And so introducing new features became difficult. With the thermal capacity having reached, the frequency stopped scaling, which means that now the parts were, it was becoming difficult to scale the performance of these devices. And so this change in the first trend impacted uh, the industry's growth. Now, designing chips has never been cheap. The plot on the left here, the bars show the development cost of chips for different technology nodes up to 45 nanometers. And the chart on the right shows the cost per 100 million gates, essentially the cost per transistor of each chip for uh, different technology nodes ranging from 90 nanometers to 7 nanometers. The cost of designing chips increased almost linearly up to 65 nanometers and then a little super linearly from 65 to 45. But even while the cost of designing chips was increasing, the cost per transistor was coming down. And this enabled the parts to become cheaper with successive generations. And this was the second trend that was contributing to the growth. Now I'm going to replace this graph on the left with a graph that uh, goes from 65 nanometers to 5 nanometers, and these bars show the cost per chip. After 28 nanometers, the cost of designing chips has grown exponentially. And because of this, now the cost per transistor has stopped reducing. In fact, it, is, it has started going up slightly. What this means is that you cannot have, you cannot reduce the price any further. And this change in the second trend has also impacted the revenues. So how has the industry responded to this impact? The established players have started consolidating. Unfortunately, that hurts innovation. And because of the exponentially rising costs, the number of startups has started dwindling. And the funding allotted to startups has also started reducing. So we went from about, sorry, we, we went from about 50 startups. To begin with, the startups were few. We went from about 50 startups in 2010 to about 30 startups in 2014. These are the total startups that received funding. In fact, if you look at the investments made across different industries in Q2 of this year, semiconductor industry received a paltry $165 million out of a total of $15.3 billion, which is about 1%. This is how badly uh, the startups are hurting. Now, while the semiconductor industry is doing poorly, the software industry is booming. And it has been for some time now. Google, Twitter, Facebook are some huge success stories from the last decade. Shopify, Instagram are example success stories of this decade. And then startups like Uber, Airbnb, Pinterest, these are some exciting startup examples which, have a lot of, which hold a lot of promise. In fact, in the, in the Q2 of this year, of all the investments that were made, software cons companies received the most, or more than half of the $15 billion. And so what we observe is that these hugely successful startups, software startups, very aggressively leverage a thriving open source ecosystem of software platforms. For example, uh, Facebook started with PHP. Uh, Twitter and Shopify use Ruby on Rails. Uh, Uber uses Node.js. Pinterest uses Memcached and Hadoop. So using open source technology, 
helps innovate faster, get to market sooner, and with minimum investment. This increases the chances of success, which further fuels innovation. And this is the cycle that the software industry has been following for almost 15 years now. But the open source story on the hardware side, unfortunately, is not this compelling. But we believe that given where we are, a bounty full of transistors, but unfortunately limited by power and frequency caps, to, we must innovate out of this corner by rethinking how we use each transistor. And we believe that the open source model will help us innovate by bringing in a wider community to help, in, to help the innovation process and lower the development cost. Now, ironically, open source hardware started before open source software in 1975 when the Homebrew Computer Club was created in Menlo Park. And Steve Wozniak, who was a member of the club, designed the first Apple computer with help of the other members in the community. And since then, open source hardware has some amount of success at the system level. Uh, open compute platform and uh, products like GoPro are some example of system hardware, open source system hardware successes. Open source circuit boards have also has seen some success. Arduino boards are very popular, so much so that Intel has now started, has introduced open source boards of their own. But we don't see success stories in the chip design or the FPGA design, the digital design space. At least I am not aware of a success story in that space yet. Now it is not that there isn't activity in uh, chip design. There is plenty of activity in open source chip design. An example of which is this excellent conference. Now as you're all well aware, a uh, chip design process involves three broad steps, front-end design, back-end design, and fabrication. And in each of these steps, an array of EDA tools are required. We see a lot of activity uh, in the front-end RTL design, processor cores, peripheral controllers, GP GPUs. Uh, you have plenty of stuff happening there. And there are also front-end design tools, open source design tools, that are developed and available. But when it comes to back-end design, the activity is not as much. Uh, for example, there really aren't any open source uh, uh, back-end IP like uh, cell libraries or IO pads or RAMs and the like. Now, there are uh, some back-end design tools, open source design tools that are available, but it is unclear whether you have a fully established tool suite that can take you from RTL to GDS2 in an advanced technology node. And when it comes to fabrication, things such as packaging or post-manufacturing uh, tests and, uh, and the like, there really aren't as many open source technologies or tools. So why has open source hardware not taken off? What can we do to make open source hardware more successful and vibrant? To answer these questions, we studied the open source software side. And we found that the open source software runs on a virtual cycle of platforms and products. A community of developers develops platforms without any direct financial incentives. And then the industry and startups use these platforms to quickly develop products. And then in turn, they contribute back to the platforms, completing this virtuous cycle. We observed that this virtual cycle is supported by 
five what we call pillars. What we found is that the, dev the community of developers finds it meaningful and practical to develop and contribute to platforms. Then the industry and uh, startups, they have a critical mass of components available to them to quickly develop products at a low cost. And once the products are, a software product is developed, it is quite easy to deploy it to the users. And finally, a permissive legal framework allows developers to contribute and use this open source technology without getting snagged in legal issues. Now this open source cycle or a similar cycle has not yet formed for open source hardware. And that is because hardware is quite different from software. Some differences are fundamental. Unlike software, hardware requires a physical embodiment before it can be used, even by the developer. The design process itself is quite complex and it requires sophisticated complex tools. Hardware is also inherently concurrent, making it difficult to design and reason about. Other differences between hardware and software are more incidental. There is activity around open source hardware, but it is not quite as focused or coordinated as the open source software activity. There is also a lack of uh, high quality development tools and platforms. Also, des uh, designing hardware is quite involved and intricate process, and the domain expertise and knowledge is not as common as software expertise. Also, people do not perceive value in open source hardware as they do in open source software, because we just haven't seen any success yet. And so it does not receive as much attention. And because of these differences, the five pillars that I talked about haven't yet quite taken hold for hardware. So in the remaining presentation, I will examine each pillar, how it impacts software, what challenges open source hardware faces, and how academia, enthusiasts and hobbyists, and the industry can come together to overcome these challenges. Now for each of these five pillars, I will also point out some trends that can prove beneficial to open source hardware. And if the community at large takes advantages of these trends, we believe that it should be able to kickstart the virtual cycle in open source hardware also. Okay, so economists and sociologists have studied why do people build open source software? And they've found that there are different uh, reasons that motivate different people. In general, people like to build, to create. And if that creation is, can be used for some purpose, so much the better. And so a lot of people find intrinsic motivation to build software and share it with others. For some, the flow of developing programs is exhilarating. Yet for others, developing open source software is an avenue to develop skills and establish credibility amongst the community. After initial hesitation and even a pushback, the industry has now embraced open source software. And they have built business models around the open source system. The industry also uh, finds it helpful to be involved, engaged in open source to improve interoperability of their products, keep the products in limelight, and attract talent. On the hardware side, the motivation levels, they exist. This is a, good, a great example. We have more than 50 attendees here. But the levels are not quite as high. And that is because of the fundamental differences between hardware and software. If you are going to need the hardware to be physically implemented before you can use it, 
then that reduces, that acts as a deterrent for newcomers to get engaged with hardware. At best, they can simulate hardware, but it really cannot, it does not do much for them. Designing processes complex, tools are not readily available. All of these debtors, uh, new students from taking up hardware. Most of them will rush uh, to the software side. In fact, when they start taking computer architecture classes, they start asking uh, the faculty, you know, how do we develop apps? Not really knowing that you can't really develop apps with hardware, not just yet. And for its part, the industry simply ignores open source hardware. But it is now beginning to take notice. At Hot Chips last year, uh, which is primarily an industry conference, uh, they had two, op uh, two presentations on open source hardware. Uh, one was on the RISC V uh, processor core, ISA processor core, and the other was a uh, Meow GPGPU. And recently, eFabulous.com, a new startup, has uh, come up. And they have a very interesting model in which they are developing open source analog IP and they are promoting the open source community. So things are changing. Uh, but this is what we can do to make it more meaningful for more and more people to get engaged with hardware. First, we can take advantage of the maker movement. More and more people are getting engaged in making what they want to use. And there have been recently uh, open source ASIC uh, companies for Bitcoin mining uh, uh, and GoPro and DJI drones. They are relying on open source technology. These will attract enthusiasts. But the existing community, what we can do is we can design, uh, we can develop IP to standard specifications. Yes. Uh, I don't mind if you ask me questions at any time. Thanks. But then somebody has to keep me on track f as far as time is concerned. Yeah, okay. actually because uh, in the end, because since you're talking about this topic, my question was pretty much... Sure. Uh, why is there uh, this kind of... Uh, uh, why is the industry approach uh, not favorable to uh, soft, uh, a free... Uh, um, Hardware designs. Why are they not disclosing? Is there what is the uh, uh, because yeah, it's uh, what stops them from doing it? Actually? Yeah, it's, it's very simple. Uh, people don't take to change very easily. The moment they start engaging in free uh, open source designs, it will disrupt their business models. And when you disrupt the business model of an established player, it is very difficult to convince the board. It is very difficult to convince the stockholders that you should cannibalize your existing business and go on a limb on doing, to do something else. They will listen, eventually they will listen, and they will listen when you start creating success stories with open source hardware. Okay, so again, can I? Um, so is there an alternative business model that you would propose? So, so that uh, people in the industry, or, or if it's not a part of the talk, I can understand, but still, if uh, your ideas on it. Okay, I'll get to that. Let me get to this point and okay, I'll address okay, thank it. You. Okay, designing to standards uh, promotes our uh, reuse of RTL. Did you have a question back there? Okay, all right. Um, and as the momentum builds up, and as it becomes more and more practical to design hardware, which I will get to next, we will see uh, a wider engagement from, uh, from others. Then academia, in particular, can do something very, very tangible and meaningful, and that is to promote hands-on hardware projects in their courses, and then have students publish those uh, projects in the open source community. Now, there are a few places where this happens. I know a, a couple of uh, universities in the U.S., and there are also uh, schools here in Europe which do this. But this needs to happen at a broader scale. Now, I believe that the industry needs to embrace open source uh, hardware. The software industry did not at first. 
uh, but eventually they did. And I believe that the industry should make at least commodity IP freely available so that more and more people design using this IP and eventually we will see more and more design starts. Now this will disrupt the existing business models, but, uh, but the industry we can figure out alternate business models just like the software industry did. And these models can be uh, service, uh, service uh, uh, avenues to generate revenues. And when you get more and more design starts, you are just going to see more and more activity uh, and more and more avenues for revenue. The service model is just one example, which is what the software industry has um, done very effectively. And then there are ancillary products. Um, once the commodity IP becomes available at large, the companies can focus on creating value adds. And that is another possible avenue for uh, revenue. Yes. So that is an interesting thought, and I did not quite, uh, at least in this work, we've not really quite focused on the bridging uh, open source software and hardware. Uh, but that is something to think about. We have focused mostly on how can we get people to honestly fabricate chips at the end of the day. And uh, maybe that's uh, bridging the software hardware gap will attract few from the software side over. That's certainly a possibility. Uh, AXI bus controller, USB controller, Ethernet controller. I uh, call them commodity IP. Ethernet controllers were first designed in the 90s. There is no reason to keep them proprietary, give them out. USB controller, give them out. So the synopsis. synopsis, yeah, they have their library, the design where they should just, in my opinion, give it out. There are others, there are other uh, small players, um, they can give them out. There's a big difference between synopsis giving out a USB controller than somebody going and getting a USB controller open course. That USB controller has seen silicon. There is a very high level of confidence that that USB controller will work. For example, Adaptiva CEO who built this uh, chip, he, he, I was talking to him and he said that, you know, I'm reluctant to go and pick up IP from open course because it's not yet proven yet. And I will get to that point eventually. But yeah, that's what I mean by commodity IP. I actually think even the ARM course, ARM 7, is commodity at this point. They should give it out. Okay, how did it become easy to develop software? In the 80s and 90s, the PCs were introduced. Everybody had PC in their houses. Then in the 90s, uh, we got internet. Internet became ubiquitous. And then somebody developed the GNU tool chain, somebody developed Linux, and all of a sudden, we had a very ubiquitous development platform. This made it practical for the community to, to engage. Unfortunately, there is no analog of this in hardware for a couple of reasons. 
for one, uh, there really isn't a development platform that you can use to develop hardware. Uh, because ultimately, at the end of the day, you have to fabricate a chip, and that chip has to be fabricated in some fab uh, in Taiwan or China or Singapore. We don't have tool chains of the standard of GNU and, and Linux and the other things that are available in software side. Now, FPGAs can be used as development platforms. But unfortunately, FPGAs are limited in size. They are restricted in the achievable clock frequencies. And unless you are working with very small sized FPGAs, for reasonably large designs, you have to go for expensive FPGAs. So it's not as cheap as having buying a PC. And FPGA tool chains are also quite bad, in a bad shape. It can take weeks or even months uh, to set up the tool chain and become productive with FPGAs. And of course, uh, EDA tools, professional EDA tools, highly expensive, not affordable by hobbyists. And then as I said before, chip design skills are really very rare. Then nobody teaches you how to run place and route or how to perform signal integrity checks uh, in a, in, a, in a layout. These things are not taught in, in university courses or rarely taught in university courses. These skills are typically acquired on job in the industry. And all of these aspects make it less practical to engage with hardware. So this is how we can make hardware design practical. We can leverage this emerging trend in which FPGAs are coming to your desktop and FPGAs are coming in the cloud data centers. So as I'm sure you know, Intel is going to put an FPGA next to a Xeon processor. Microsoft is deploying hundreds of thousands of FPGAs in the data centers. You can expect that these FPGAs will also become available in the open cloud. So once that happens, the community should make it trivial to put designs in the FPGAs uh, by providing device-specific portable packages that people can pick and integrate their own designs into. We need the community at large to actively develop high-quality EDA tools. There was a flurry of research that happened in, in the EDA space in the 90s. Unfortunately, that research has not been sustained over the last decade or so. That needs to happen so that we get out of this EDA gridlock. Um, we basically need a GCC plus glibc plus make or apt get module install like utilities for hardware so that we can, people can pick up designs, integrate their designs, in, and then release them back. It becomes, so you start lowering the barrier for people to engage with hardware. I also think that the academia can help by providing FPGA farms uh, for op openly accessible to anybody. They can be used f uh, to teach courses and they should be made available to the general public. I believe that the industry should put FPGAs in the cloud and this might be actually be happening. You will see uh, with the push that Microsoft is making, you will see other players also deploy FPGAs in the cloud. Sorry? What do you mean by cloud? What I mean by cloud is um, data centers. So today, Microsoft accelerates Bing search using FPGAs. Now, the same data center can be rented by uh, public. And when you rent a server, that server will have an FPGA. It's not happening just yet, and I'm not claiming that Microsoft will do that. But now that Microsoft is using FPGAs and servers, eventually those FPGAs will end up in the public uh, servers, and then they will be available to the public, or can become available to public. I also think that the EDA industry should, Synopsis and Cadence should make EDA tools available for free, at least non-premium versions. Again, this will disrupt their business models. 
but what it will do is instead of the 40 startups and 20 companies, instead of about 60 or 70 companies, they will suddenly have 500 companies trying to use their tools. And of those 500, 100, 200 will eventually buy the premium licenses. I also feel that the industry must simplify the path from RTL uh, to chip prototypes. For example, there are a handful of uh, EDA companies and fabs. Synopsis, ARM, and let's say TSMC can get together to create a push button flow where you, are, you have an RTL, you can use Synopsys tools to synthesize, place and route, do all the analysis, integrity checks that need to be done, and then that GDS2 gets shipped to TSMC and it gets fabbed in a push button approach. Perhaps only for one technology node, maybe this is what needs to be done for say 45 nanometers. But once you have this push button flow, you will see a lot of prototypes getting built. And once you have successful prototypes, you will see eventually products being built on advanced technology nodes. Who? Yes, they tried. They tried, but it has to be integrated all the way across. It has to go from uh, sim simulation, synthesis, place and route, post fabrication, testing, all the way across. And maybe they were a little early. Maybe it's time to revisit that. On the software side, a full suite of components are available. Uh, web development frameworks, language compilers, uh, backend databases, uh, what have you. All of these components are available. Package managers are available, which can be used to uh, draw the components that you want and plug in your own components and get going. And this helps make minimum viable products cheaply and quickly. For example, Shopify and Instagram invested less than a half a million dollars to build their products. In contrast, if you've been following news, Intel bought Movidius earlier this year. Movidius had invested more than $70 million, and they got acquired for about 400. There are rumors that Intel has acquired another, st another startup called Soft Machines for about 400 million. Now that's just a rumor. Soft Machines had invested $186 million. Sorry? 250, okay, I stand corrected, 250. Half a million and 200 million. This, we have to absolutely narrow this gap. Okay, so on the hardware side, a critical mass is really uh, missing, especially in the backend IP, cell libraries, RAMs, IO pads, analog IP. That critical mass has to be created. And then whatever is available, people are quite hesitant. They're not quite sure, is the IP proven? Is it trustworthy? Is it mature? Uh, so these issues have to be ironed out. And these are all, some of these are also open research areas, especially ensuring that the designs are trustworthy. But they are not unsolvable problems, fortunately. And then we need full design flows. It's not enough to just release RTL of a RISC-V processor. You have to release the verification infrastructure. You have to release this timing scripts. You have to release the synthesis scripts. You have to release the place and route scripts. All of this has to be released if you want to see your own work to be reused by others. So to create a critical mass, we can take advantage of one other emerging trend. As the technology nodes, as we run out of new and new technology nodes, and there's a high chance we might run out at five nanometers, or I don't know if there's anything beyond that. But we are stabilizing on a very few technology nodes. For example, it's likely that 28 nanometers will one of the nodes that people fabricate the chips in. And there may be one or two others. But once you have a few nodes to play with, then the community can start building backend IP for these few nodes. You don't have to build backend IP for every single node. I think the community also needs to apply a coordinated effort in building platforms. There is no point in really having a scattershot approach where I, de I develop a processor core, 
and then somebody else develops another processor core somewhere else. Let us focus on building platforms which can be leveraged and reused. So I have a processor core that attaches to a standard bus, let us say AXI. I know Wishbone is, uh, is an open source standard. But then others also design IP that plugs into this platform, and this is the platform that gets verified. And all of the infrastructure related to this platform gets released back. Then we will find at least the first success based on this one platform. And then we can go on to build more platforms and innovate further. As this critical mass comes together, I think if at some point the industry has to take a leap of faith and use this open source IP, but potentially in collaboration with the developers. So we, you don't want the industry to go off on its own. You want them to work with the collaborators so that the success, uh, the, the chances of success are higher. I also think that the industry must encourage eFabless like models. Uh, eFabless is creating a platform where open source designers can come and seek uh, designs and industry can come and issue requests for quotes on this platform. Encouraging such platforms will be very beneficial. And I also feel that the industry must start sharing information to facilitate some of the design process, especially for backend IP. Now comes another fundamental difference between hardware and software. It is very easy uh, to deploy software. You download, you install, and you're ready to go. And when it comes to developers, they need develop only for a few platforms, Mac OS, Linux, Windows, and two process, main processor architectures, ARM and x86. But on the hardware side, uh, you have to fabricate a chip before it can be deployed. And hardware chips are, have to be deployed in appliances. And these appliances can be different things, cameras, drones, microwave ovens, and refrigerators, and what have you. Although this is a fundamental difference, we still think that it can be overcome. So when it comes to FPGA designs, we believe that um, the community at large can contribute in uh, creating deployment frameworks analogous to Rails and Heroku and package managers. And the community can also uh, develop uh, tools for post-manufacturing processes. As for the industry, uh, they can take an approach of building modular appliances where you can break apart the appliance into Lego pieces and reattach them uh, to rebuild the appliance. Uh, Google's Era phone, Era phone is, is an example of such an appliance. I think what this does is, this will then attract enthusiasts and hobbyists to build their own chips, plug into these pieces, and enhance the utility of the appliances. I also feel that the industry can make uh, fab shuttle services uh, easier for people to use. Was there a question? Yeah. I'm not. Sh I'm sorry. I didn't quite understand. IP exact, I see, I see. I see. Okay. I see, okay. That's good to know. So some of these things are being addressed. It's very happy to note that. And finally, there's a very strong legal framework that the software developers can uh, rely on. There are ample choices of licenses they can choose from uh, which provide a range of permissions. Uh, you have, I have listed only four here, but there are about 50 licenses that software developers can choose from. And there are no NDAs to haggle over for software developers. You pick a license of your choice, these licenses are very well understood, and you can get going. Unfortunately, on hardware side, the licenses are not yet quite mature. 
a lot of open source hardware gets released under the same licenses that the software guys use, but there are some fundamental issues with hardware that may make these licenses inapplicable. So for example, when you are synthesizing your IP with somebody else's IP, physically the two IPs can get integrated and intermingle. Once that happens, there is no fine line between your IP and somebody else's IP. And you may get exposed to a licenses, uh, restrictions or permissions. This is something that you have to be very careful about. Also, in the hardware design process, at some point you will hand off your design to a third party, for example, to a fab for the uh, manufacturing. Once that happens, some open source licensing terms can kick in. When you give off a design, it's unclear whether it is distribution or it is a private copy. So these are some intricate intricacies that are absent in software, but which can come back to bite the hardware developers. And in general, on the hardware side, uh, people have to deal with very complex uh, non-disclosure agreements with companies, which can make it very challenging for people to, to do anything meaningful. Now on the software side, just last week I wanted to, re I wanted to release some software uh, into the open source pool. And I was trying to figure out what license I should use. So I stumbled upon this uh, choose-license.org or com, where they have a very nice template where I could choose, I could, I could quickly decide what type of permissions I wanted to give, whether I was concerned with patents or not, and other, uh, other things that I should have been thinking about, and within 10 minutes, I had picked the license that I wanted to use. Now, on the hardware side, uh, we have organizations that are thinking about this. For example, Open Source Hardware Association has a very long list of uh, FAQs to help with the licensing process for hardware. For one, this FAQ is very long, and if you were to actually read it, which I did, you will find statements like, this is a complicated question and no easy answer, with no easy answer. Or you will find another statement which says, things are more complicated when it comes to hardware. So we really don't have the licensing aspect of hardware figured out. And this is where uh, we need the community to come together and think about licenses that are tailored to hardware. And we need to create a similar set of menus that provides a range of permissions for hardware designers. As for the industry, they need to simplify, yes. I think the licensing situation is, is still very immature. Um, nothing's been tested in court. There's, there are not many lawyers that really understand this stuff. Well, there are a few, but they don't say much in the open source world. Um, it's a pity. We, I was planning to have a licensing session this year, but I didn't get around to arranging it. But uh, yeah, it's a, maybe we can have more discussion at the end. But it's yeah, it's, it's. I completely agree. It's one of the main areas that that is holding uh, the area back. I tried to write a license to solve this, these problems, but uh, you know that, that was somewhere in the middle of permissive and, and restrictive. But um, yeah, and there are a few out there. So it, it's funny, like uh, everything you're mentioning, that there are areas which they are things that, that are being addressed by the community, yes. and that's why this is the perfect talk to kind of kick this conference off because it's exactly you know what we try to address here. And yeah, I mean, I'd, it would be good to talk more about licensing maybe later. But um, let's put it on. is there another question? Yeah. So, so one thing about my presentation is I'm pointing out I, things that are being acted upon, but not yet quite there. Uh, King, where do you think things like the solder pad license, the CERN open hardware license, the Tapper open hardware license, where do they fit into this framework? I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear it. There are three hardware licenses crafted by lawyers for open source hardware. There's John Ackerman down in Phoenix who's done the TAPR, the okay. okay. There is um, the CERN open hardware license done by Andrew Katz. 
and there is the solder pad open hardware license, also done by Andrew Katz. Okay. So it strikes me the legal framework may a bit, be a bit more advanced I see. than you think. I mean, those are licenses that are well-crafted. They work within the limitations of hardware starting to stray into patent law rather than copyright. They work like Apache by licensing the I by see. software licensing effectively the documentation without which any design is useful. So I think that the legal framework's a bit further along. Further advanced. along, okay. Good. So that's also good to know that uh, things are moving. But perhaps we need to now coddle all of them together and uh, popularize them. I also think that industries should start thinking about donating uh, their patents, at least for non-leading edge IP, so that designers and users uh, don't have to worry about this aspect. A lot of donation has happened on the software side, as I'm sure you're all aware of. Hardware side, the patenting business is more, um, people get a little more antsy about patents. On the software side, not as much. So before I conclude, um, let me give an example of, uh, of how something like this may actually be used in practice. Imagine that Google iGlass were an open source system. And imagine it was a modular appliance in which you could take out a piece of the uh, system and ins insert your own. Imagine you had a 3D printer where you created a plastic uh, socket for a chip that you designed. And imagine that you designed a chip using a very well-tested platform, openly available, available platform, in which you plugged in your own IP, let us say, to recognize faces using neural networks. I think that uh, the open source hardware can make this happen uh, at a much larger scale than it is possible today at much lower uh, development costs. So to conclude, uh, the semiconductor, apart from viewing this as merely a, merely a hobby, uh, the semiconductor industry is struggling. And open source can drive both revenue and innovation uh, in the industry. And this will require academia, hobbyists, and industry to come together to make hardware design meaningful for a larger community, practical for everybody, and make it easy, and, and create a critical mass, and make it easy uh, to deploy hardware products. And that concludes my talk. Thank you. Yep. Fantastic. That's good. So I, we've got about 20 minutes for questions now, which I think we'll, we'll use up. Um, so Olaf had his hand up first. Hi. Uh, thank you for an excellent presentation. I think it covered very much our thoughts as well, and uh, I agree with most of that. And from the Foster Foundation side, we can say that uh, two of the things you mentioned, licenses, and uh, licenses is the first thing that this is, we know that this is a mess. Uh, and I would also like to say to Jeremy that we have to also recognize that open source hardware is not equal to open source FPGA ASIC development. So we call this open source silicon because it's technically it falls between somewhere between software and hardware. And I think we should be, need to be careful with that because the licenses, many of the licenses for open source hardware are for like things like PCB and thing, uh, so they might not actually apply to RTL development. And also if you want to see a very good tear down of the, of the LGPL uh, for uh, silicon. You should look at last year's slides from, uh, or the video from last year's uh, OWRConf where Xavier Sarano of CERN, he's, uh, he took a lot of time to, to look and see how GPL would work and he realized it was not working at all. Uh, and the other thing you talked about was uh, something we also saw last year, but the visibility and trustability. First of all, people can't find open source IP cores uh, and if they do, they have no idea if they work, they have no idea how they work. And uh, from the Foster Foundation side, we, have, we are working on both addressing the visibility and trustability issue. We'll talk about, more about that tomorrow, and also licenses. And the final thing, uh, there is already a package manager for uh, IP course. It's called FUSOC. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you for informing me. 
<laughs> I see. <laughs> oh, no, it's perfect. So we will add that in our paper when, uh, in its camera-ready version. Yes. Uh, my name is Edmund Hummenberger. Um, thank you very much for your talk. So uh, it covers almost everything uh, from the problem definition. I would present in the same way. Um, I think um, we disagree a little bit on the strategy. Um, for the first thing, you referred to GCC, and GCC um, was an example where open source really took off. But the thing is, there was one guy from Sun uh, who put his money he got from Sun into uh, the support for GCC, which gave GCC the credibility for the industry. So the open source silicon is still waiting for this donor to put money and credibility behind uh, open silicon. Uh, can, I about address, can I address that? Before yes. You? The times have changed. We now have Kickstarter programs. So do we have to wait for somebody to come and give, um, push us, or do we want to find alternate ways of making this happen. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, concerning your platform, I, th I thought about that two years ago too, and I came to the same conclusion as you. As therefore, um, I started the ICO board project, which can be a platform like the one you have described, which is an FPGA development, which has a complete tool chain for FPGA projects, and as happens in the last month, the community is developing around this FPGA open source tool chain. Uh, but this is not yet uh, for making chips. Uh, so we miss something for making chips too. And this is um, a cheap way to tape out uh, to chips. Uh, actually, um, you named eFabless, the company which is doing um, open source tools for making chips. Um, we are working with them. We are trying to do a first tape out for a 32-bit CPU with uh, analog I.O. Uh, we got from XFab the cell libraries. And it's like going first through the jungle and hitting all the bugs of all tools for the tool chain. And it takes a lot of effort, and the thing is, this effort is done in the free time of all the people involved, because there is no money in it, there is no sponsoring, there is nothing. So it, it takes really time uh, to really make a silicon proof of the to open source tool chain. I think once we reach that point that we have a first open source silicon with, made with open source tools, then we might have one proven point. Uh, I think a big problem is that the universities get the, uh, the tools, uh, the commercial tools for free. And therefore, there is not much incentive to invest time of students, of PhDs, into improving open source software. And I understand their point of view because they got two years for the silicon and they need to write the PhD and they don't want to uh, put in effort in the open source tool because there they get no really um, uh, papers out of it, but I think this, that's a big problem. Um, another thing is, uh, you said that Microsoft is deploying a lot of FPGAs. So I want to, before I give my comment, what is the uh, relation of Microsoft and your speech here? Is it, do you present Microsoft or is it just your private hobby that you're talking about this? Yes, as I said, uh, I, my presentation is totally my view, not Microsoft. As a researcher, I have my own independent agenda, research agenda at Microsoft, which is totally disconnected from Microsoft's business. Okay. Uh, I'm, uh, Microsoft, as I know, is using Altera chips in the FPGA cloud. Is that true? Uh, my, that's, yeah, that is public no knowledge that yeah. it is using Altera. Okay. Um, I'm talking since one and a half year with Intel because Intel took over Altera. And so if you think that uh, there would be open source tools to program uh, the Microsoft FPGA cloud, then you, you are not, you're wrong. So let me correct you. I did not say there will be open source FPGA tools. 
I said there is a chance that the FPGAs will become available in open cloud. Not what tools. is that good? Huh? So what's the profit from that? If I can buy an FPGA and if I deploy it on the FPG in the cloud, that doesn't make me any good. Well, you now have FPGAs widely available. So you can buy an FPGA board for $60, but it'll be very small in size. You can fit in a limited design in it. If you want to do something reasonably large, you need larger FPGAs, which can get expensive in a hurry. And now with these sophisticated FPGAs out in the cloud, readily available, you have a development platform that is now ubiquitous. The problem is the Altera design tools are written for professional FPGA designers. I spoke to the guy who was in charge for the writing the FPGA tools at Altera, and he said, our tools are a mess. So, that, so I agree with you on that. I'm not saying that the tools are now magically available. That work still has to be done, as I pointed out. Um, I think uh, your strategy to m bring the industry members uh, to the point where they release their IP will not happen. I think it will require an outsider who is a large user of FPGA technology and FPGA chips like Microsoft to push for the uh, tool side. Thank you. All good points. Very well taken. Yeah, it's open. Hi, my name is Elkim Roa. Uh, I'm from Colombia. I'm um, uh, Maybe you hear about it in Twitter. Um, so here I have a, a silicon proven board. Can I demo? Um, <clears throat> I think your, your, your arguments and your uh, thoughts to, to are kind of, they can converge in some sense. I think I, we have to call um, for a different way to discuss this. We should have a kind of a debate or forum today, tonight or tomorrow. For this, I think this is a good opportunity because there are different thoughts here that are thought for, for a guy from the industry and the academy that have been here, people, enthusiastic people that, that are trying to do new, uh, new stuff. I'm coming out, I'm, I'm a guy from academy, I'm a professor, but I'm also an enthusiast. I'm also coming from the industry, so I have that kind of, I, I, all that together. Uh, we should discuss this. We definitely should have some kind of opening session to discuss kind of what should be and just try to uh, put some thoughts out there to see what should be what, what, what is missing you know you, you point out good uh, definitely good points uh, you also point out that there is maybe a, just a guy that we need with a lot of money right to put it here and there are different things there I, I, like I say I have been using uh, commercial tools you just say there are me there are mess. I have a lot of friends from Cadence, a lot of friends that are working on Synopsis. They say this is a mess too when we do the stuff here, but it works, you know, and it makes a lot of money. So, we should, I mean, I'm calling for Julius and David and maybe Olaf to make a, you know, to do some opening session today, tonight, or tomorrow to have this kind of debate where we should bring up uh, a lot of points that uh, Gupta brought. Here. I knew this would spawn a lot of discussion. I, I'm not sure we have time, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, it, it's a great idea. It's something, if we can, we'll see if we can do it. Um, but definitely next year. There are a lot of things we didn't get around to planning this year. So Andre's been waiting patiently. Yeah. Yes. Bossy was founded to address all of these things. Andre? Um, I'm a Brit. I traditionally start off with not an awful lot of stuff. So, you know, I have a fine tradition and such things. Um, I found the fact that I wanted to do some stuff. Uh, I had to do it for free. And so I was able to actually garner a set of tools together, like, dare I say, the Altera webpack for ModelSim, now GHVHDL. Um, you have an element of a gumption failure. If you can't actually that get something together, then you haven't tried hard enough. So that's the one thing I would actually say, and I can't attest to the quality of Altera tools these days. Um, the second thing, the thing that actually really stops this is the fact that an awful lot of employers sign and put into their contract for their employees that anything they develop is theirs as in the companies. 
So if you want to develop open software, then generally it gets, gets away with it. That's fine. There's no clawback. But for more than a hardware space, then if you actually want to develop something, either there's a case of thou shalt not to, to, to release anything into the open, open hardware environment, like the IP, or the assumption of the fact that, well, you did it while we were in your employ, we'll grab it. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, so that's a good point that, uh, that there are those uh, employment contracts that the companies have. Um, honestly speaking, that was um, not something that uh, we considered within the scope of what we did here. But thinking on my feet, um, that was also the case with software at some point, and then at some point the, um, the community figured out a way to, to move out of that, those, those, those types of restrictions. But this is true for hardware side, and I, I think the push has to initially come from academia and hobbies at large. Um, they might have to do the heavy lifting in the beginning and then slowly create some cracks so that uh, people within the industry can also start playing in the space. That is what I can think of at the moment. That is right. So software companies do. So in my contract, I'm allowed to quote unquote freelance and all of that. But I think his point was the hardware companies may not, uh, not yet have caught on. But as this gentleman is saying that they may not be open to something like this. OK, uh, my name is Kajinda Panisar. Um, I've got a, a few comments to make. You drew analogy between GCC and Linux. It took a very long time for that to happen. The best part of 20 years for that to, to be adopted. The other thing is, um, having platforms is great. Uh, and I agree that you know, having a, a, a platform to develop on is great, and you'll get a lot of uh, people playing with it. But it's no use unless you can make products out of it, unless people can actually make something that's useful. And in order to do that, it's a, lot, it's a huge step going from something, a library of IP, to stitching it together to put it into a, an SOC. And that's a big enough step in itself. But then you could have verified the hell out of it, really. So, if, for example, if you're putting things into real systems, like, say, a pacemaker or a cell phone, you know, it's a big, huge, humongous step from something tinkering in your bedroom. That's yeah. going to be an even longer time for it to happen. Yeah, I think it will be a long time before open source designs get into pacemakers. But they could get into something else uh, much sooner. Uh, but your point, you, you were right, I mean, no, these but, are... But the systems, uh, the, it, whatever they are, from uh, a microcontroller that goes in, inside a washing machine to uh, something that's safely critical, they still need to be verified. You can't just take them off the shelf and say, there's a chip, it works. You have to be damn sure it's going to do the job. So in that respect, hardware is a different game than software. The parameters are going to be different, and um, uh, the approaches have, will have to be slightly different. But coming back to the platform, the comment on platform, I, I, I think that is the beachhead that the community can use. Here is a platform. A lot of people have looked at it. A lot of people have developed it. There's a, it's mature. There's a lot of IP. You have all the flows for it. Then it will become easier for something like that to get into a product. If we don't have a platform, we have scattered IP, it's going to be that much harder. What is that? Um, well, first of all, I think it was a very interesting talk. And thank you very much for it. At some point, you mentioned that one of the differences 
between software and hardware from this point of view is that hardware has to be realized, right? And that makes it more difficult uh, for it to succeed, the open source hardware than the open source software or free software. So, but, okay, it has to be realized, but it also must be feasible to be used by users, right? And uh, it's my impression that in the last decades or in the last years, even though IP libraries has been published, even by uh, manufacturers, for example, in the European space sector, you know, for the Leon processors, you get an IP, IP library with simulators and everything under a GPL, but the realization of it is becoming less and less hackable as time goes. Because nowadays, systems on, on chips, you know, the SOC concept, is becoming like ubiquitous, especially in embedded systems. But now that concept is jumping also in laptops to laptops and other commodity hardware. And those systems are absolutely not hackable. You cannot replace anything in those systems. You cannot update anything in those systems. You cannot replace the interrupts controller of your Leon system because the Leon system, it comes in an ASIC or even in an FPGA, so you will have to uh, replace the whole FPGA or, or the whole ASIC if you want to hack one component of it. So, my question is, um, what is your take on this? I mean, do you have any idea what would be required to convince the industry to sacrifice things like efficiency, like cost of production, and also, you know, those some spurious evil uh, purposes too. Like, you know, if, if you get a system on a chip and you want to upgrade a part of it, you will have to buy a complete new system. What is your take on this? Do you think that, do you have any idea on how to make the hardware more hackable? So I see two, two ways to tackle that. Uh, one is, I think it is already happening, and I gave an example of the of Google Era phone. But they have a modular appliance, so, you, so it's not a, a black box. Uh, there are pieces that you can take out and you can connect um, different pieces to change the functionality or enhance the functionality of your appliance. So that is one direction. Now, Google is thinking about it, so something is happening in that space. The other direction is within the community, you have uh, 3D printers, you have the maker movement, the printers are getting more and more sophisticated. You can make a gun using a printer. And uh, that could be an approach where we are able to make, at least to begin with, start out with quote unquote toy appliances, which are customizable, which are modular and are customizable where somebody might be able to fabricate a chip or even plug in an FPGA. Uh, I see these as two possible approaches. I saw uh, you shake your head. Perhaps you have an opinion. We're nearly out of time, guys. I, I don't, not, sure, not sure we have time to go into it now. Um, but if it's quick, we've got a couple of minutes. Yeah? Um, I think um, there are two different aspects. The one is the big, expensive chips uh, with m millions and billions of transistors. We will not have the tools to make this kind of chips within the next five to 10 years. But there are the chips in 180 nanometers. We have the tools to do them. And I think we should think about not manufacturing chips for appliances, but uh, replacing PCBs with chips. And the customers would be like those Kickstarter campaigns. They are making 100, 200, 500, 1,000, or 2,000, or 5,000 devices. With one custom chip, they designed themselves with open source tools. And what we need is a possibility to manufacture these chips 10 pieces, 20 pieces, 50 pieces, 100 pieces. And those pieces should not cost a minimum of 20,000 US, but they should cost. $10 each. So if you have a service where you can order 100 chips for 10 euro each, then you can make a product out of it and sell it on Kickstarter. And um, I hope that we will sometime get to that point and I'm working towards that goal. Um, 
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am interested in FPGA technology from the point of education, and uh, I started wiring TTL chips together when I was about 14, back in 1980. And um, you built up sequential logic, and then microprocessors came along and I got diverted. But I really believe that we need simple platforms which can be handed out, virtually given away to high school kids and um, uh, uh, first year undergraduates. And um, rather than dealing with a, uh, an FPGA that costs, I don't know, $25, $30, um, we're talking about a, a $5 FPGA on a board that uh, costs uh, around about $30. So we're bringing, um, we're bringing the product down in price and making it more accessible to a wider audience. And uh, so myself and Alan here, we've spent the summer creating such a platform and uh, we hope to be able to tell you about it later this weekend. So we have two more, maybe the last two? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so, uh, my name is Anton Klotz and uh, I'm from, uh, from Cadence Design Systems, um, so basically the, the bad guy here. <laughs> okay, so uh, I, have, I have two comments. Uh, so, one, uh, one comment is you are saying that uh, the number of um, hardware um, uh, startups is declining, uh, but currently, so if I read E Times, for example, so basically every week there is a new startup uh, uh, coming from the stealth mode, so which are doing uh, deep, uh, um, deep learning chips or um, uh, autonomous driving chips. So at least my impression is that uh, now uh, with these new, new directions uh, in the hardware development, the number of startups is uh, rising again. Um, the, other, um, the other thing that I want to mention, uh, so you are calling uh, Synopsys to release the, the USB controller. I mean, so Cadence also has USB controllers, and uh, so currently, I would have a really hard time to convince my CEO why we should uh, why we should do it. Because um, I mean, it is it is a business uh, which is still quite healthy. So we are investing lot, uh, millions of dollars. We are earning um, some of it. So um, yeah. So why 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 should we do it? And we, we so we don't feel the pressure. Yeah. So. Sir, sorry. Um, a, a water, uh, yes. Yeah, well, so world garden, yes, but so, so cur currently we are feeling quite comfortable in this garden. <laughs> yeah, so, so very quickly, so you're right, uh, there are some uh, interesting startups that are coming up, uh, some of them presented at Hot Chips in August, uh, so there is a bit of an uptick in hardware startups, but it is nowhere close to what the software guys are doing. To answer your second question, why should uh, Cadence or Synopsys release their IP? Even they are, I mean, they are not, even their revenues are getting affected. Today, they are not going to release those IPs because that, they, that's a dis disruptive. But eventually, when the community starts putting pressure and this open source starts get, gathering momentum, they will start, there was a time when they charged uh, royalties on these IPs, USB controllers. Then they were, they, at some point they had to change their model and only charge a licensing fee. And now that licensing fee is $10,000 and now it is free. If you're using my EDA tools, you know, you get these few components for free. That is the natural progression in which things will eventually go, I think, and should. Okay, one quick last one. Hi, uh, my name is Michael Broder. Um, so, this last comment is really sort of a, a rebuttal to the comment that you made about uh, silicon and its, its lack of accessibility. Um, we do have the ability to print those million and billion transistor chips. The issue is right now with silicon, it's not accessible. And I have a, an acquaintance uh, at the University of Washington and she specializes in uh, organic polymer based uh, semiconductors uh, and she focuses she mostly uh, focuses on photovoltaics uh, but right now they have the ability to use this material to replace traditional uh, silicon based transistors 
So, and they're also able to print it out in mass, uh, like a printing press. So it's cheap, it's accessible, it scales. Um, so we could very well be looking at it in the next five years, as you're talking about, you know, as silicon maybe becomes more accessible, um, the whole, uh, the, sub, the material that we use for computers may very well change uh, as well. Cool. Uh, that'll have to be it, I think, for time constraints. Gagan, thank you very much, mate. It was a fantastic talk. Cheers.